Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Miami University's Hamilton campus. I'm Mike Pratt, Associate Provost and Dean of the College of Professional Studies and Applied Sciences. And tonight, it's my pleasure to uh, welcome you to uh, a very special Colligan Project evening. This is an evening when we honor some of our best teachers in the name of one of our best teachers, the Jim Blunt History Educator Award. And we also have a presentation and lecture by Dr. Furstenberg. So without further ado, let me call the director of the Colligan Project, Dr. Kurt Ellison, to the stand. Kurt? Good evening. Good evening. Good. Evening. Good. Uh, welcome to a celebration of outstanding history educators. Before we begin, however, let us pause in reflection for the life of the Honorable John E. Dolloboy, class of 1942, Vice President for Alumni Affairs at Miami University, United States Ambassador to Luxembourg, the last surviving interrogator from the Nuremberg War Crimes Trials, and the author of Pattern of Circles, an Ambassador's Story. Mr. Dolloboy spoke several times for the Colligan Project, and in his honor, we confer the Dolloboy History Prize occasionally upon a nationally distinguished teacher, writer, or maker of history. Let us remember John Dolloboy. Thank you. Now, in the Colligan History Project, we believe that teaching the ability to think historically is central to democracy and to the quality of our future because it allows us to consider life experience in perspective, to critique change in substantive ways, and to make informed decisions that guide our citizenship. Good history teachers nurture these abilities. This is a major goal of public history as well, and tonight I want to take the time to thank supporters of the Colligan History Project who make all of our efforts possible. First gratitude goes to members of the Michael J. Colligan Committee of the Hamilton Community Foundation, Dave Ballou, Jim Blunt, Bob Cottrell, Mike Dingledine, John Gadouli, Pat Muller, Susan Myers, and Karen Whalen. Thank them for their thoughtful support, generosity, and trust. I also thank the staff of Miami University, especially Miami University Hamilton, Dean Mike Pratt, Associate Dean Rob Shorman, Director of Marketing Shelley Diano, Web Communications Manager Liz Miller, Wilkes Center Director Brett Couch, Downtown Center Coordinator John Vaughn, Colligan Assistant Director Matthew Smith, and especially Program Assistant LaDonna Hoskins. So many be people behind this program. Thank you, Craig Rouse of Compass Medis Media Production and John Hutton, TriTech Light and Sound. We thank our partners in program development this year, the Organization of American Historians, the Lane Public Libraries, Heritage Hall Museum, the Butler County Historical Society, Fitton Center for Creative Arts, Hamilton City Schools, and the City of Hamilton. Please join me in recognizing all these fine people and organizations, along with many other unnamed colleagues who support our work. I hope you'll come back for our series next fall when we return to our sesquicentennial Civil War theme and the title is Hard Road to Liberty, Ohio in the Civil War. On September 16, in cooperation with Justice and Community Studies for Criminal Justice Week, Dr. Kelly Johnson will speak at the Downtown Center on human trafficking and slavery today. In early October, we plan to host a panel of historians and others discussing the significance of John Hunt Morgan's 1864 Ohio-Indiana raid and how we remember it. 
On October 29, Princeton University Emeritus Professor James McPherson, often said to be the nation's leading Civil War historian, will accept the Dollar Boy History Prize and give the Dollar Boy Prize Lecture, October 29. November 13, in partnership with the Miami Regionals Artist Series, we will present a musical evening with Jay Unger and Molly Mason. Unger composed a Shokin Farewell. Can you sing that? You know. This was a song used as a theme for Ken Burns' PBS series on the Civil War, and Unger and Mason played much of the traditional music used in its soundtrack. They'll be here for a program of Civil War and traditional music of the 19th century. After tonight's presentations and the Blunt Awards lecture by Dr. Fersenberg, please stay for a reception in the atrium to enjoy refreshments, meet the awardees and Mr. Blunt, and greet Dr. Fersenberg for a book signing. If you're looking for further reading, primary materials, or information on many local history topics, especially if you're a teacher, during the reception, pick up the handout resources for teaching local history in the Smith Library of Regional History at Oxford Lane Library. Now it's my pleasure to welcome and introduce several previous winners, that is, in earlier years, of the Jim Blunt History Educator Award. Uh, Mr. Corbin Moore is here tonight from Hamilton City Schools. Where is Corbin? Right here. Susan Gresham is here from Marshall School at Talawanda City Schools. Uh, we thought Miss Holly Templeton would be here, but I don't see Holly. Has Holly come in? Well, Holly is from Fairfield, and she's been quite a, a presence on our campus, too. So uh, she was an important winner last year. Now I'm very happy to introduce our assistant director for the Colligan History Project, Professor Matthew Smith, to introduce Mr. Blunt, who will help us confer awards upon this year's recipients. Matthew. The namesake of the uh, 2014 History Educator Awards uh, is a ma man who needs uh, probably a uh, very limited introduction to this audience, but I will try and uh, do him justice. Um, whether he was writing for the Cincinnati Enquirer or the Hamilton Journal News, where he was editor for 15 years, or, or whether he was teaching in our public schools, uh, where he was named Hamilton's Teacher of the Year, or inaugural Teacher of the Year in 1992, Jim Blunt is uh, synonymous with communicating the past. Not everyone may be aware, but uh, Jim ha has attributed this passion to his um, childhood growing up in this, in this town where he uh, used to sit around listening to the, uh, the stories that were uh, bandied about uh, at the bar, which his father owned uh, near the river. And this was something which, uh, again, sort of uh, triggered his enthusiasm for um, the past uh, and uh, disentangling uh, the myths from the realities of the stories that he was, was hearing. Uh, so Jim's research into regional history is something that has, has really been a, a lifetime uh, labor of, uh, of, of love. Um, it's led to more than, uh, I, th I think, 14, well, it's led to 14 um, books being published uh, on uh, various topics of regional history. Uh, his monthly uh, newsletters published online by the Lane Libraries are essential reading for anyone who's even remotely interested in the, the history of uh, Hamilton and uh, this region, uh, and it covers uh, all sorts of topics ranging from um, the uh, industrial heritage of Hamilton, uh, the Civil War, um, and, of course, Hamilton's uh, legacy as the little Chicago of the 1920s and 1930s when the uh, folks uh, connected with John Dillinger and, and other colorful characters used to uh, come down here to uh, lay low for a while. Um, and Jim continues to draw uh, large crowds with his public lectures, um, including numerous uh, Colligan history presentations uh, over the past um, years, uh, especially, uh, I think, worth uh, recognizing is, is the, the recent 
1913, uh, 2013 centennial of the Great Miami River, River Flood, um, in which Jim was uh, working both uh, in front of the microphone and, and behind the scenes, uh, giving presentations, um, organizing, sitting on committees, uh, and making that event uh, a, a really significant success and uh, drawing a great deal of, of public awareness to this, this momentous um, uh, chapter in our, our, in our local history. Um, so uh, Jim Blunt uh, was only, I think, last year recognized as the official city of Hamilton uh, historian, again, another first, first uh, official historian of the city of Hamilton. And I'm sure you'll agree that this uh, award was well-earned and uh, long overdue. So I'm, I'm very happy uh, to be sitting next to Jim and his wife, Jackie, tonight. And uh, it's my honor uh, to um, introduce Jim Blunt to present the uh, 2014 Jim, Jim Blunt History Educator Awards. Thanks very much. There are two recipients of the award, and I'm going to ask you to come up uh, in alphabetical order, if you will. Uh, Lisa Eubanks. Lisa? Just come right on up here. I'll say, I'll say a word about her. Uh, Lisa uh, teaches ninth grade American history and 10th grade world studies, sociology, global studies, law, and you at Ross High School an award-winning teacher at Ross since 2010 and earlier at Mount Healthy High School and Princeton Middle School. Ms. Eubanks is a literacy coach for teacher professional development and reading, uh, reading comprehension, the mock trial team coach, and the American Sign Language Club advisor. Her students read a variety of texts, evaluate diverse arguments, and work in cooperative learning groups that research and produce pageants with a talent presentation such as Mr. Latin American Revolution. I want to see this, but <clears throat> it is, she says, my job to prepare students for whatever life holds for them after high school. Lisa Eubanks. Kim Young. Ms. Kim T. Young teaches senior high world history and American history, American studies, and government at Fairfield High School. Ms. Young first had a career as an executive retail buyer, then changed careers, earned a Master of Arts in Teaching, and began teaching at Fairfield Intermediate School in 1995. She promotes rigorous debate to encourage active citizenship and personalizes history through student diary entries and performance of first-person historical characters. As in the 1920s Jazz Expo, where period figures presented an Art Deco speakeasy with music, food, interviews, entertainment, and a 1920s radio show. I don't know about Dillinger. Was it? <laughs> her, her work, said a colleague, epitomizes a student-centered, inquiry-based, problem-solving style that is enlightening and flat-out fun. Kim Young. We have one more award, and this one's a little bit of a departure for the Blunt History Educator Awards. This year, the committee elected to give a special recognition for contributions to public history to Richard O. Jones, former writer and editor of the Hamilton Journal News. And those of you who know Mr. Jones know he is a very civic-minded person and personality, and he's so civic-minded that he's monitoring the polling place in Morgan Township at this very hour. So <clears throat> we're going to celebrate him in absentia, and at the next appropriate Colligan program, he'll receive these wonderful items, which we will take good care of. But I want to say something about Mr. Jones. 
At the Hamilton Journal News from 1989 to 2013, Richard O. Jones served as arts entertainment writer, theater and music critic, columnist, features writer, lifestyle editor, editor of a weekly community newspaper, special sections editor, and beat reporter covering city government, education, and community development. He produced a nationally syndicated column and wrote over 10,000 stories that earned awards from the Associated Press, Society of Professional Journalists, the National Endowment for the Arts, Annenberg Institute, and the Hamilton Community. Richard O. has published often on Hamilton's rich history, including 23 thoughtful and well-researched articles between March 7 and May 5, 2013, for the City of Hamilton, Great Miami River, Flood of 1913 Centennial Commemoration. He brought that historic event vividly to public attention and enhanced our understanding of it quite well. Thank you, Mr. Jones. Uh, Matthew will now introduce uh, tonight's speaker, Francois Furstenberg. Thank you, Kurt. Um, it's a real uh, personal pleasure today to be able to uh, introduce this evening's uh, keynote speaker, Dr. Francois Furstenberg, uh, who teaches at Johns Hopkins University. Um, History News Network uh, recently named uh, Francois one of the nation's top young historians. Um, but anyone who has actually met Francois will know that first and foremost, he's just a, a very nice chap. Um, uh, he has a, a very uh, impressive resume, um, which is, is uh, detailed in, in uh, a, a very sketchy form in, in this uh, brochure, this handout. Um, but it includes um, degrees from Columbia University as well as a PhD from the uh, institution where he now teaches, Johns Hopkins, um, as well as uh, a stint as the, uh, recently as the J.W. McConnell Family Foundation Chair in American Studies at uh, the University of uh, Montreal, or should that be the uh, Université de Montreal. Uh, his name, uh, his uh, name and his um, Canadian connections, as I've sort of rather... Uh, stumblingly attempted to, to suggest, um, point towards uh, French accents in his own history, although he was actually raised in uh, the United States, I believe, uh, in, in Boston and Washington, D.C. Um, but transatlantic influences have certainly shaped his scholarship, um, which can particularly be seen in his recent book uh, published this year, uh, When the United States Spoke French, uh, French Emigres, Land and Empire in the Age of Revolutions. Um, an earlier book, In the Name of the Father, George Washington's Legacy, Slavery and the Making of a Nation, which was also, I believe, published, uh, Penguin, was it 2006? Yep. Uh, was a uh, finalist for the Washington Book Prize, very prestigious award, and uh, won rave reviews in, in numerous journals, including uh, Publishers Weekly, uh, the Journal of the Early Republic, and the Journal of American History, which described it as, quote, complex and smartly conceived, a novel and stimulating overview of cultural politics in the early republic. In addition to numerous academic articles and presentations, Francois is also hugely active uh, beyond the academy, contributing commentary to the, uh, among other uh, publications, the New York Times, Washington Post, and the Baltimore Sun. Um, but perhaps most intriguing for me was that he was also hired as the uh, historical consultant for the popular video game series Assassin's Creed, um, and I'm actually old enough to remember when uh, computer games were, were uh, basically involved uh, batting a, a ping pong ball across a, a, a blank screen. Uh, so I'm quite impressed that they now have historical consultants. Um, Francois' topic this evening, however, is the War of 1812 and the Long War for the West, um, which ties into, again, the Colligan uh, series recently on the War of 1812, but also reflects the speaker's long-standing interest in the complex and fascinating courses of history in the Ohio Valley. And so I'm very pleased uh, to welcome tonight our speaker, Dr. Francois Furstenberg. Hello, good evening. Well, 
Thank you. Uh, first of all, Matthew uh, Smith for that very generous and uh, warm introduction and for um, inviting me here tonight. And I want to thank uh, Kurt Ellison as well uh, for, all, for all your work and Ladana Hoskins for um, arranging everything this evening. And of course, Drew Caton for having so generously hosted me last night. Um, I also want to say that it's a, great, it's a great honor and a pleasure for me to be here on a night when we're, um, when we're honoring uh, high school teachers. Uh, as it happens, my girlfriend is a math teacher in, at high school, so I, I know how much work goes into it, and uh, I'm always in awe of the, of, the, uh, of the work and of the influence that, that teachers have on the lives of their students, much more, I dare say, than, than um, college professors do. Um, and it's also, a, it's also a pleasure, I have to say, to, to be able to talk to people who um, actually want to be in the room. Usually I have to talk to people who have to be in the room. <laughs> so I'm here tonight to talk about the War of 1812 and the long struggle for the West. I think I have a slide. Oops. Here we go. Uh, at first glance, the significance of the War of 1812 uh, may seem underwhelming. Consider just a few facts. In 1814, the British marched 5,000 troops to Washington and they burned down the White House. A year later, Andrew Jackson led 4,000 men at the Battle of New Orleans. He won such a spectacular victory against the British that uh, it made him a hero, eventually President of the United States, and historians named an entire historical period after him. Meanwhile, in June of 1812, Napoleon marched the largest army ever assembled in European history into Russia, 650,000 troops under the French banner. At Leipzig, a few years earlier in 1813, 600,000 soldiers battled it out. 150,000 men were killed or wounded in that one single battle. Total casualties, total uh, US casualties in the War of 1812 were about 2,600 killed uh, or wounded. So you might wonder uh, what kind of self-respecting war this is. It's a war that doesn't even have a name, it just has a date. <laughs> in all of human history, according to Wikipedia, only 18 wars have had a lower death toll. In terms of its body count, the War of 1812 is on the order of something, again, according to Wikipedia, something called the, the Football War, which apparently took place in 1969. We got a math, uh, national anthem out of it, that's true. Um, and it's true that sometimes people call it the Second American Revolution. But if you stop to think about it for a minute, it doesn't seem like a very good sign when a war has to appropriate the name of another war to uh, assert its significance. And you note that the o appropriation only goes in one direction. I've never heard anyone called the American Revolution the first war of 1812. <laughs> One curious feature about the war is that when looking back, most participants imagined that they were the underdogs. Americans fought off the British Empire for the second time in 30 years. It was the greatest empire of the age. The Canadians, meanwhile, fought off the big bad Americans, and they celebrated today as, the words, uh, as in the words of Prime Minister Stephen Harper's recent advertisement, the war for Canada. Never mind that Canada didn't even exist as a country. And in case you're curious, uh, I just want to show you, because I can't resist this, having lived in Canada for uh, more than 12 years, more than 11 years, uh, I want to show you a little clip from YouTube on how the Canadians, this actually was on Canadian television, how the Canadians, or at least let's say the Canadian government, because having knowing many Canadians, and especially Quebecois, not everybody views it this way, but how the Canadian government wanted the War of 1812 to be remembered. 200 years ago, the United States invaded our territory. But we defended our land. We stood side by side. Won the fight for Canada. Learn more about the War of eighteen twelve. Visit eighteen twelve. GC. CA. A message from the Government of Canada. I, I love that ad. I, I'm not sure what it, the ad is for exactly, but, but I think it's um, really an extraordinary video. It's quite amazing how, the, how they want to portray the War of 1812 as this unifying war, which brings together 
uh, the English, the French, all Native Americans, men and women, everybody against, um, against the American invaders. But what I want to suggest to you is that if, uh, for Stephen Harper, this is the fight, the War of 1812 is a fight for Canada, um, I want to suggest tonight that for all of its apparent insignificance, it was also a fight for the United States. Now, I admit, I admit that might seem like a hard sell, but I want to um, persuade you of this by focusing on the West and on the Ohio Valley um, and the broader Mississippi Valley in particular. It's a fight, I think, a fight for uh, America, a fight for the United States that can only be understood if we pull back chronologically and spatially, if we expand our view in both space and time. If we look at the uh, long period from the middle of the 18th century all the way to the end of the war in 1815, and if we pull out to look not just at the United States and Great Britain, but also to Native Americans in the Ohio Valley um, and in the Southeast, to European powers, including France and Spain, to slaves in the Caribbean, all of these were critical in shaping American history in this period. And only, I think, with this broader spatial and temporal view can we really understand the War of 1812 in its fullest significance. So I'm going to talk tonight uh, first about space, about geography. I'll spend a little time talking about the general geographical and geopolitical challenges faced by the United States and in in, in North America, I guess, in the uh, middle of the 18th century, um, and to try to genuinely locate the West in its broadest contours. And I've become more and more interested as, the, um, as I've been teaching in maps and geography. Um, I bombard my students with, with maps, and I'm glad to be able to bombard a new audience tonight. Um, and then, once we've sort of established the spatial and geographic contours of North America, I'll take you through the chronology uh, from the middle of the 18th century to 1812. So I'll start out uh, with the geography of North America, starting from east to west, as I guess in, in some minds it, it does begin. Coastal, we begin with the post coastal plain on the east coast. Um, this is the area, the, this coastal plain here, where we find uh, the first English settlements, it's located between the Appalachian Mountains and the Atlantic. It's tremendously fertile soil. And waterways, water in general, is of crucial importance. Of course, it's along the ocean, which is necessary for transportation, for commerce. Um, and it's, uh, it's uh, penetrated by coastal waterways. And, and it's called the, the um, coastal plain because it's tidal. It's, a, it's the tide water. The tide actually penetrates all the way to what's called the fall line here. Um, and uh, many great rivers uh, go from the Atlantic uh, deep inland, much deeper than in, than in other uh, continents, the Delaware River, the Connecticut, the Susquehanna, the Potomac. Water rushing off the Appalachians down into the coastal plain provided energy for many of uh, the United States' uh, or North America's earliest cities, like from Trenton to Baltimore to Richmond, all the way down along the fall line here. Moving further inland, uh, settlers would have confronted the Appalachians. It's one of the oldest mountain chains in the world. The Appalachians divide the coastal plain from the broader Mississippi Valley. For Native Americans who had long lived on the continent and for the Europeans who arrived along the coast, the Appalachians were a great barrier. These maps from the 18th century, I think, give a good uh, sense of how Europeans viewed the Appalachians. It was a wall that divided the coast from the Mississippi Valley. And it still actually looks this way uh, when you look at it from Google Maps. It's, it's, a, uh, it's a big barrier, um, and it still looks this way when you fly over, when you look at it. From, uh, from Google Maps. The Appalachians can only be crossed in a few places. Uh, Iroquois country here um, in this area along the Mohawk Va River Valley is, is one of the very few places that gives a natural break in the Appalachian barrier. And it's one of the re reasons that the Iroquois were so um, st significant um, geopolitically in the early America. The Appalachians separate the coastal plain from the broad Mississippi Valley, everything between the Rocky Mountains all the way to the Appalachians. The Mississippi River is the third largest drainage basin in the world. And the Appalachians um, are tremendously important in, uh, in this sense, that is to say that every drop of water which falls to the east of the Appalachians ends in the Atlantic Ocean. Every drop of water that falls to the west of the Appalachians ends in the Gulf of Mexico. And it's a simple fact, but I think it's hard to exaggerate the significance of that one simple fact. All commerce and transportation in this period travels along water. And so I want to make three points with this general geography in mind. The first is that we tend to think of American history as in much the way I've just portrayed it, moving from east to west. 
But this is not the axis by which the continent's natural geography uh, shapes it. The north-south axis is, um, in fact, significantly more important than the east-west axis. North-south axis is significantly more important. It um, shapes, I think, the continent's geography. And establishing a continental empire, which was going to stretch from east to west, from the Atlantic all the way to the Pacific, in a sense, goes against nature. The second fact that I want to highlight is that as soon as you cross the Appalachians, you begin to look south and west towards New Orleans, not east back to the Atlantic coast. Maybe that's obvious to everyone here in Hamilton, I'm not sure. Um, but I grew up on the East Coast, and it's certainly not obvious for me. Even places that I associate with the East, like Pittsburgh, are by the courses of waterways associated with um, tide connected to New Orleans. And the third, I think, um, fact that, that devolves out of this is um, the intimate connection that exists between the Great Lakes and the Mississippi Valley and the Caribbean Sea. Connecting the Mississippi Valley connects, in a sense, the Great Lakes down the Mississippi to the Caribbean. And one can think about the Caribbean as, a, as I think Europeans did in the 18th century, as a sort of inland lake, uh, uh, as a sort of, uh, sorry, as a lake, as a kind of uh, Mediterranean on the western side of the Atlantic. So this natural geography structured the map of European empires. Here's a map of the French Empire in North America. It was organized along the north-south axis that I just talked about. It, began, it begins in the St. Lawrence uh, River, moving up the St. Lawrence to the Great Lakes, and then down the Mississippi Valley into the Gulf of Mexico. This north-south axis structures the, uh, the French Empire. And it was organized, therefore, along the waterways. And I think that north-south axis um, and this, the, the structure, in a sense, of this first French empire is, is one of the keys to understanding all of American history all the way to 1812. The French empire follows the river valleys and the watersheds, and um, it's key to understanding the war, the struggle for the West that I'm talking about this evening. And we can see this uh, sort of configuration quite clearly from the maps that Europeans drew in all their limited geographical knowledge, uh, the, the maps that Europeans drew in the 18th century to understand to themselves, to explain to themselves, the, the, the configurations of North America and the French Empire. Here's a French map from 1702. I like this map a lot. I think it, it shows us the ways that the French understood New France along the lines of this north-south axis, moving from uh, the St. Lawrence Valley to the Great Lakes, down the Mississippi, and into the Gulf of Mexico. The English colonies, by, by contrast, were hemmed in between the Appalachians and, uh, and the uh, Atlantic Ocean. We can think about it, and it certainly looks this way from, uh, from these maps, as a, a kind of internal continental highway, a series of routes that pull the continent together. And these waterways were key to the travel of French and to Native Americans throughout, throughout this period. One of the, one of the routes uh, that connected the French Empire was going down the St. Lawrence across the Great Lakes, down, Mich down Lake Michigan, across to the Chicago River, and then down the Mississippi River. A second, um, even more direct route would come up the St. Lawrence along the Great Lakes, down Lake Erie, and then right uh, very nearby along the uh, Wabash Mami Portage down to the Ohio River um, and across. And a third route that would get people from Quebec to New Orleans, in a sense, uh, came down the St. Lawrence along, the, along Lake Erie, this time along the top of Lake Erie, along this little portage here, which is uh, now Waterford, Pennsylvania, and then down the Allegheny River into the Ohio, and then once again down to the Mississippi and to New Orleans. These, these were the three primary water routes, the three primary routes that connected, Mon that connected Quebec to, um, to New Orleans. So let's keep this idea um, of a highway, of a kind of inland highway in mind structured along these water routes. Here's another map which I think shows the second aspect of the way this empire was understood or this, this landmass was understood. This is a map from 1757 and once again I think it shows us how French uh, imperial policymakers understood their North American empire. It was a French empire that stretched north-south from the Great Lakes down St. Lawrence Valley and Great Lakes down the Mississippi into the Caribbean. So this is a vast um, territory and the French of course I think needless to say don't hold it alone. If the French Empire was an empire of waterways, it was also an empire of alliances. A rich set of Native American alliances throughout the, throughout the West structured the French Empire. The French helped to mediate relationships among Native peoples throughout the continental interior, and Native villages, meanwhile, played a sort of balance of power politics between the French and the British. 
against these alliances were the pressures that were stemming from uh, the continuing pressures of English settlement, pushing back into the continent uh, from the coastal plain into the Appalachians, pushing up the Susquehanna and down the Sh Shenandoah Valleys, pushing into the Georgia and the, and the Carolina backcountries. There's a long history of conflict among settlers and natives and among settlers um, in the backcountry and eastern elites. Mountains, in a sense, have always uh, separated uh, upland societies from, from lowland and coastal societies. And the settlers, uh, as they pushed into the mountains, were determined to get more land um, against, very, uh, against the wishes of Native Americans and very often against the wishes of eastern elites. And this, um, as they pushed across the Appalachians, as these settlers pushed across the Appalachians, they began, uh, their loyalties once again, they began to look west and not east back towards uh, their, their coastal capitals. When one French traveler toured the Ohio Valley, um, he remarked that people along the Atlantic refer to the area west of the Appalachians as the back country. But scarcely had I crossed the Alleghenies, he said, before I heard the residents call the Atlantic coast the back country, which proves that their geographical situation has given their views and their interests a new direction in conformity with that of the waters that serve as the roads and the doors towards the Gulf of Mexico. So these were the underlying pressures, I think, at work, these, these geographical and demographic pressures that were at work and which led the governor of Virginia to send an emissary to Fort LaBeouf, uh, the portage uh, that I was just talking about on what's now Waterford, Pennsylvania, uh, the portage between Lake Erie and the Allegheny River, to tell the French that they were in Virginia. And I think we all here know how that, um, how that ended. The French, of course, refused and war ensued. It was a war that started on the very margins of the French and British empires, on a, on a uh, far out place where the two empires connected, but it quickly turned into a global war. Winston Churchill called it the First World War. The three greatest empires of the age, Britain, France, and Spain, all battled it uh, out across the, across the globe. Voltaire famously wrote uh, in Candide that these two nations are at war over several acres of snow near Canada. <laughs> the Quebecois still resent that, that phrase. But in fact, it wasn't true. The, the, there were battles in the Caribbean, in Europe, in Africa, and in the Pacific. Um, and we can begin to see, I think, the connections between the Ohio Valley and the world. It made the Ohio Valley in this period a world, a place of world historical significance. I'm probably preaching to the choir when I say that here in Hamilton. But given the fact that the First World War started as a war for the Ohio Valley, it seems hard to dispute the profound significance of this region to global history. For the British, the outcome of the war seemed like a resounding victory. After more than 100 years of war, they had chased their bitter enemies out of the continent. They had vast new territorial acquisitions, not just in America, but also in India, in the Caribbean, and more. There was a huge upsurge of British patriotism in, in North America. But as so often happens, victory, this uh, huge victory, contained the seeds of defeat. It was a territorial empire for the first time. The British Empire was a territorial empire for the first time, and it always understood itself and been, in fact, a maritime empire. This created almost impossible uh, difficulties for the British. They had a huge debt in the first place, um, and they had continuing struggles with Native Americans more pressingly. In fact, this map, uh, which one sees in textbooks very often, dramatically overstates the, uh, the situation in North America after the Seven Years' War. Native Americans, uh, who were the great allies of the French, weren't involved in the peace negotiations in Paris. They didn't recognize the cessions that the French granted to the British. Although you have conquered the French, said an Ojibwa chief to a British trader, summing up a common sentiment, you have not yet conquered us. And so they kept fighting. The Seven Years' War continued in the West long after it was, uh, the peace treaty was signed in Paris. Historians know it as Pontiac's War. And I think it's possible to see Pontiac's War as, in a sense, the first uh, American Revolution, the, the Native Americans fighting against the British Empire in the West, fighting against the British Empire um, to uh, have more autonomy and protect their homeland. Uh, the British, by this time, the British government was um, tired of fighting, wanted to make war, wanted to stop the spending, um, and so it established uh, limits along the western frontier, along the, uh, along the Appalachian Mountains. This was, in a sense, a victory for Native Americans. They won their American Revolution. Their territory was recognized, was off limits to colonial settlement. But the problem is that this attempt to make peace by the British government, to make peace with Native Americans, infuriated the English settlers along the coast. 
From the uh, settlers' perspective, they had been fighting uh, their bitter enemies, the French, for over 100 years. Finally, uh, their great hope, the French, had been expelled from Canada, fulfilling all their hopes. And now, on the heels of, the, of, of this greatest of all victories, they were suddenly banned from the West, this region for which they had fought. It seemed to them almost as though there was some kind of plot afoot to keep them in political bondage. Eventually, these um, and other resentments led to resistance along the coast. And just as Native Americans in the West um, had done in the West, so now settlers in the East uh, thought that the British um, uh, government was trying to enslave them. Colonists began to wonder if there wasn't some plot afoot to keep them in submission. The British government became, uh, the British colonists rather, became further panicked when the Quebec Act removed the West from their sovereignty and attached it to the newly formed province of Quebec. We see, um, we see this, this map here of the new province of Quebec, uh, which is also outlined here. Um, I happen to think actually that the Quebec Act is one of the great um, and understudied uh, moments in, in, this, in this period. What the colonists seem to be witnessing here what the English colonists seem to be witnessing here is the reconstruction of the French Empire under a new name. The north-south axis, the north-south continental axis, is recreated once again. The St. Lawrence Valley is reconnected to the Great Lakes and reconnected to the Ohio Valley, to the uh, Mississippi River. Um, and just as the French had done, now the British uh, government, in alliance with Native Americans, are set to keep the British settlers hemmed in uh, between the Appalachians and the coast. The British and Indian Alliance now controls all the routes from the St. Lawrence uh, across, the, uh, across the, the Great Lakes and down the Mississippi. And so once again, the story becomes very familiar. Washington again steps onto the stage of history. This time, he fights the British rather than the French. But what I want to emphasize here is that the American Revolution isn't the first American Revolution. That was Pontiac's War. The Settlers' Rebellion is, in a sense, the second American Revolution. I'm giving you all these Washington images to make a little tie-in with my book, which is <laughs> available for sale outside after the talk. <laughs> the war was fought, and, and um, the American settlers, with the, uh, with the help of the French, needless to say, were uh, succeeded in, in gaining their independence. But what I think is most um, striking about the end of the war is the extraordinarily, extraordinarily generous uh, treaty that the United States uh, was able to acquire, secure, from the British government. The British negotiators, Lord Shelburne and later uh, the Marquess of Lansdowne, turned much of Quebec over to the United States. And let's, let's take a minute to just look at these maps. Because here are the contours of Quebec, at least according to the Quebec Act, according to the British Empire, in 1774. This region really hadn't been uh, won militarily by the Americans. The great victory was at Yorktown, um, thanks to the French Navy. It would have been uh, the Native Americans continued to be dominant in the region, along with the forts that the British still controlled, all the key forts along the Great Lakes. Um, their access, their, their connection between the St. Lawrence, the Great Lakes, and the Mississippi was secure. And uh, they, might, they might have demanded to keep it, and there would have been very little that the American negotiators could have done at the end of the war. In fact, they were negotiating apart from the French um, in, uh, in contravention of their treaty obligations with the French. Um, and the French didn't want them to see, uh, didn't want to see the Americans control uh, this vast stretch of the continent. They wanted to keep the American settlers hemmed in between the Appalachians and the coast, uh, and thus making them a client state of a great French power. That's why, in fact, the British were motivated to give such generous sessions to the Americans after the war. They wanted to avoid the United States becoming a French, becoming dependent on France, becoming a weak client state of the French. But when the British granted these, the Northwest, granted Quebec, uh, to the Americans, it was once again a betrayal of their native allies. Just as the French had abandoned their allies in the peace treaty of 1763, so the British now abandoned their native allies in 1783. One Native American said to a British officer that he never could believe that our king could pretend to cede to America what was not his own to give. And just as Native Americans had continued to fight after 1763, so they continued to fight after 1783. There are good reasons, in fact, to think that the Europeans, uh, at least some Europeans, didn't recognize these territorial sessions either. This is a really interesting map um, from the Library of Congress. And at some point, when I have more time, I'll, I'm going to do a little research to find out uh, why the shading was done the way it was. Um, we see 
the, uh, this is a map done in 1783, uh, supposedly according to the new, the new treaty signed uh, between Britain and the United States. But you can see that these lines of sessions, um, the, these, these colored lines, more or less follow the, the, treaty, the treaty lines of Fort Stanwix. This actually might have been, this might have been the frontier, the border of the United States after 1783, but it wasn't. Um, perhaps it should have been. Uh, here's, in a sense, here's, here's the, um, the treaty limits uh, of native territory. And in fact, what's interesting about this is the one place that, this, that these colored lines don't follow the Treaty of Fort Stanwix, um, I think I'm right in saying this, we've got a specialist here in the room, um, is uh, to, it shades around the Oneida, who had fought, who had allied in the revolution, one of the only Iroquois nations, the only Iroquois nation that allied with the, uh, the United States, uh, it goes around the Oneida territory and to come down here. So we get a sense here that even, in, even among European policymakers, there are some who consider this to be the territorial frontier of the United States. But um, as I said, the Native Americans uh, continue to, to fight on. And in a sense, if you can say that if, if the settlers, if the British settlers won their independence from the British Empire, uh, the Native American War continues throughout the 1780s and the 1790s. They continue to fight for, their, for control of their homeland. Their War of Independence uh, goes on. But this time they're fighting the United States instead of the British Empire. One might perhaps call this the Third American Revolution. Whatever we call it, uh, we can see that from the Native American perspective, the period from 1750 to the end of the century and beyond is one long struggle to maintain control of their homeland. I warned you that I was going to bombard you with maps. Here's their situation. Uh, here's the, the sort of geopolitical situation after the American Revolution. The British uh, are still in the north. Despite their, their sessions in the 1783 treaty, they are hanging on to the forts, the, the key forts along the Great Lakes, Fort Niagara, uh, Detroit, Michilimackinac. Uh, they're still holding these forts in, in close alliance with Native Americans uh, in the area. The Spanish uh, are in control of Louisiana um, and of the entire Gulf Coast. This area um, is uh, Native American nations in alliance with the Spanish Empire. Here we have Native Americans in, largely in alliance with the British. Uh, and American U.S. sovereignty only extends really in this area of Kentucky um, and a little piece of Tennessee. The British, um, with, this with their control of the forts and of the Native American alliances, are still in a position to hold this north-south continental axis. They're still able to come down the, the St. Lawrence, across the Great Lakes, and down the Ohio Valley into the, the Mississippi, and still in a position to keep the uh, Americans hemmed in between the Appalachians and the coast. This is uh, the situation um, at which Washington, for a third time, steps onto the historical scene. Washington is inaugurated in 1789. His first priority as president, I think above all, is to mobilize an army to fight for the Northwest. But his army encounters a series of defeats, including St. Clair's catastrophic defeat. Not until 1794 does the United States begin to establish itself in the Northwest. Uh, and this is really what, the, what this portrait is uh, depicting. This, by the way, is the Lansdowne portrait, I think, in a, in a wonderful sort of odd coincidence. Um, it was a portrait that was given to Lord Lansdowne, to the same uh, person who had signed. Uh, in fact, he's the same person who drew up the, uh, the, 1760, the Royal Proclamation of 1763. He was the person who, uh, he was the, the, the British Prime Minister who granted these generous sessions to the United States. And this is known as the Lansdowne portrait. You can see it in the Smithsonian today. Um, which was given to him in 1796, and it portrays uh, the, the changing American scene after 1794, after uh, the, the, the defeat of Native Americans that fall on timbers. The storm clouds in the back are clearing. There's even a rainbow up here uh, showing the bright American future. Uh, 1794 is a turning point in many respects. It's, it's one of the key, I think, and, and, uh, and perhaps least um, thought about turning points in early American history. It's the, it's the year that, um, that Wayne decisively defeats the Ohio Valley Indians. It's the year that the Americans sign the Jay Treaty with, with Great Britain, reestablishing um, a closer ties with its former enemy. And because of that, it's the year that French and American uh, relations begin to fall apart. France and the United States had been uh, 
had been allies since the revolution, since France uh, more or less secured American independence after the revolution, and they had become even closer allies after the French Revolution um, and the creation of uh, a republic in France. These were now sister republics. But after 1794, as the Americans begin to turn um, back into the arms of the British Empire, back into a commercial and even political uh, alliance with the British, the, the French uh, begin to look away. They begin to, they decide um, that their, their ally, United States, um, has proven itself to be uh, quite fickle. Much of the purpose that the French uh, policymakers had, had, uh, that had driven them to intervene in the American Revolution in, in the 1770s uh, related to the Caribbean. The French wanted to reestablish, they wanted not just to take away the, the commerce of the, of the um, American um, colonies for the British Empire, but they wanted to reestablish their control uh, of the Caribbean. This was the heart of the French Empire. In fact, it was the economic heart of, the, uh, of, of, of all European empires at this point, producing um, enormous wealth through its uh, sugar, coffee, and other colonial products. Um, and the French, uh, as I, you know, we saw earlier how, how North America and the Caribbean are all understood by Europeans as one unit, one interconnected unit. Um, and the French wanted to make sure that the, Ameri that, that, uh, the new United States uh, secured uh, all kinds of provisions for its French colonies, established bases of military operations uh, for the French Navy to fight wars against the British, secured lumber, tar, and other, and other commodities for its plantations and for its Navy. And now that the United States was moving into a closer alliance with Great Britain, with the great French enemy, the French policymakers begin setting their sights on Louisiana. They decide that they're going to need a more secure foothold in North America, that their ally has proven too unreliable uh, to count on in a time of war, uh, and that they need their own sec more secure foothold. Uh, so, the, so Napoleon decides to send an army uh, across the Atlantic to, to Louisiana, but their first stop is to the French colony of Saint-Domingue. Saint-Domingue, which has been, uh, which uh, later the, the country of Haiti, right here on the western, the western portion of uh, the island of Hispaniola, of Santo Domingo. Uh, Saint-Domingue, which had been the most lucrative uh, French possession in the Caribbean, in, in the world, in fact. Uh, slaves had, had begun to rebel in 1791, and at this point, uh, slavery had been abolished. The slaves had, had, had risen up and, and gained their freedom. Uh, so Napoleon decides, um, in a spectacular uh, misjudgment, that he's going to send his army first to Saint-Domingue to put slaves back into slavery. Um, and reestablish the sugar plantations in the island of Saint-Domingue, after which the, his army will sail on through the Windward Passage up into the Gulf of Mexico and hold on to New Orleans and thus secure the new uh, uh, territory of Louisiana, the new French empire in North America. Don't forget about this map of New France. French authorities had always understood uh, the Caribbean and the Mississippi Valley as interconnected. Um, but, of course, uh, Napoleon's mission didn't work out as planned. Napoleon's army arrived first in Saint-Domingue, where it was devastated by uh, the victorious slaves, former slaves, um, and by the colonial, uh, by the tropical diseases, mostly yellow fever. It was an indescribably vicious war. Both the British, who had tried to conquer Saint-Domingue in the mid-1790s, and the French, who now tried to conquer it once again, lost more soldiers in Saint-Domingue than they did at Waterloo. By 1803, after, after two years of, after a year and a half of war, it was clear to Napoleon that he lacked the forces now to hold on to Louisiana. All these uh, tens of thousands of soldiers that he'd sent on to Saint-Domingue uh, could no longer, had been, had been killed and could no longer sail on to, Louis, to New Orleans um, and uh, to, to, onto Louisiana. And in fact, without having lost Saint-Domingue, the very purpose of Louisiana, the very purpose of reacquiring Louisiana was large, had largely disappeared. Um, the, the purpose of Louisiana, as we saw, was in order was to uh, secure, was to supply the Caribbean uh, uh, colonies. So Napoleon decided to uh, sell Louisiana to the Americans. His reason uh, was the same, the same reason that had caused that had that had uh, that had uh, worried American colonists since the early, since the earliest days of the French Empire. He worried that the British, now in control of the Great Lakes, would sail down from the Great Lakes down the Mississippi uh, to New Orleans. Napoleon worried that the British would control Louisiana and not uh, the French. And so he decided to counter British power uh, by strengthening American power. He wanted to avoid the United States becoming a client state of Great Britain. 
So this is once a, a sort of repeat of what had happened in 1783 when the British granted generous terms to the Americans to avoid them becoming a weak client state of France. Now the French granted generous terms to the Americans to avoid them becoming a weak client state of the British. Jefferson had warned, in fact, the French that if, uh, if they took New Orleans, that uh, the US would ally with the British and fight uh, in a fight against the French for Louisiana. And that session proved to be crucial to the United States. It gave them 10 years to expand and to grow and to strengthen and to consolidate their hold on the Trans-Appalachian West. The British um, never did give up entirely, or at least British officers in the Great Lakes never did give up entirely their ambitions in the Ohio Valley. Um, but it's only now, I think, with this much longer and larger perspective that we can see how the War of 1812 fits into this picture. Once again, the British team up with their Native American allies to try to push the United States out of the Northwest. One of the British war aims was the establishment of a 250,000 square mile territory in the Northwest between the United States and Canada. From the Native American perspective, 1812 was the last realistic chance to establish a neutral Native American territory between the British and the Americans. Once again, the British sought to establish the, con the contours of the former French Empire down down the Mississippi, the, the St. Lawrence Valley, through the Great Lakes, along these critical forts, and down um, the, the Ohio to the Mississippi River. There were major battles in War of 1812 across the Great Lakes and New Orleans, all the critical uh, geographic points of this north-south axis, New Orleans, Great Lakes, St. Lawrence. The British might have succeeded uh, this time against the Americans, who were much uh, less well-equipped, um, lacking their French ally, but the British were otherwise occupied in Europe. This is a map of France um, and its dependencies and its allies in, uh, in this period. Napoleon controlled nearly all of Europe when the US declared war with Great Britain. No wonder the British sent so few troops to the United States. The fighting in America during the War of 1812 was little more than an afterthought for the British government, which was entirely occupied with its uh, existential, one would say, struggle against the French. And so uh, it's possible, I think, to say uh, that once again, it was France that saved the United States. Just as France had done in the previous American Revolution, so they did again, drawing the energies of the British military and allowing the Americans to eke out a victory uh, in North America, or at least uh, a tie. The French had lost their battle for world supremacy to the British, but they set the stage for the emergence of the United States a century later as the world's preeminent power. Napoleon's strategy in Europe had failed, but in a sense, his American strategy succeeded. He had hoped that by selling Louisiana, he would create a power in North America great enough to counter British dominance, and although it took about 100 years, uh, that strategy did, in fact, prevail. And so I think um, in light of this long struggle for the West that I've talked about, it may be more accurate to call the War of 1812 not the second American Revolution, but um, rather the third or perhaps the fourth or maybe even the fifth American Revolution. Thank you very much. So, questions, comments, observations? Right here. Please speak in the microphone so everyone can hear you. I remember in high school they talked about the Im impressment of, of American sailors is be, being a, a big cause of us going to war. Can you talk talk uh, talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I mean, I think well. So, the, so I focused here on the West, um, to the largely to the exclusion of the Atlantic, uh, or at least at least that aspect of of the Atlantic. Um, but certainly, the impressment of American sailors by the British Navy was uh, a key, if not the key. Uh, uh, unleashing of the War of 1812. The, the British Navy uh, would, would, would stop American uh, ships and would, if, if, if sailors couldn't prove that they were American citizens, they would be taken into the British Navy. Sometimes even those who did prove, they would be taken to the British Navy um, and impressed into the British Navy in, in really uh, grueling conditions. So, um, so it, it, was a, it was in this sense a, a struggle to preserve uh, American rights of their, of their citizens. But I think, um, I mean, what I would say is that although this is 
a, a cause and perhaps the, the, uh, the cause that unleashes the revolution, the, the War of 1812 rather, um, what, I've, what I've been trying to look at here are the kind of deeper causes, I mean the more structural uh, geographic causes that are, but, but the impressment, I mean one doesn't want to, this is not the only story that goes along with the War of 1812, it's, it's the sort of the back story, the, the, um, the western story. How did the Spanish figure into all this? Um, were they playing both sides, or what were they up to? Okay, so the Spanish, I didn't, I didn't talk about them very much because you know, I could have kept you here all night talking about this, but the Spanish uh, figure centrally into all of this. The, after um, after the, the American Revolution, uh, Louisiana, well, after the Se Seven Years' War, Louisiana um, was transferred into Spanish hands, and that, that sort of suited the French and the British at, uh, both to have, to have the territory controlled by Spain. Spain uh, was never, much concerned with Louisiana. It was never of tremendous importance to them as, as a territory. The, most of the, of the Spanish interest in Louisiana was in a sense to serve as a buffer zone between uh, what they viewed as the continually expansioning, uh, America, expansionist Americans um, and their much more lucrative possessions in Mexico, largely silver, um, silver deposits they continued to, to ship out. Um, and they wanted, they wanted control of the Gulf Coast. They wanted control of the entire Gulf Coast. And they made, for, for, uh, for about 40 years, they made the Gulf uh, into, a, into a Spanish lake, as they, as they like to think about it, to protect their shipping out, um, out of Mexico, through along this crucial uh, channel between Cuba and Florida, and out back to Spain. Um, so that was their primary sort of geostrategic interest. That, that was, um, and they never, they never uh, made much of an effort to make Louisiana into a Spanish territory. In fact, uh, French officers, former officers in the French, um, uh, of the French regime, continued to staff their military forts, which were now Spanish, uh, for much of this period. And New Orleans remained a predominantly French city throughout this period. Um, and it was only under uh, continual pressure by the French government, and by Napoleon in particular, um, when, when he came to power in the late 1790s, that the, that the Spanish were, were eventually persuaded to cede uh, Louisiana to the French. And one of the arguments that the French made to the, Sp to the Spanish in persuading them to cede Louisiana was that France was a much greater power in, um, in the Caribbean, had a much greater uh, navy at, at this point. I mean, they were crushing the, the British in the Caribbean in the 1790s. And they said, if you give us the territory of Louisiana, we will much better protect your colonies in Mexico. So, so it was the same logic that had led them to control Louisiana that led Spain, in a sense, to cede it to, to France, although, um, although Spain ceded it really under, under pressure. I mean, Napoleon was in control of most of Europe at this point, so he more or less demanded it. And um, it was only at that point, shortly after the, the, uh, the French, when they realized their, when Napoleon realized his military defeat in Saint-Domingue that he then quickly sold the colony to the Americans. And Spanish diplomats were outraged by this. I mean, the French had, had committed not to sell Louisiana to the United States. Um, and they, in fact, at first tried to refuse the, the, to, to recognize the session. And one of the reasons that the, that the purchase was rushed through, the, um, the terms of the treaty were rushed through and the sale was, was, was rushed through, so that was, the Spanish couldn't object and couldn't try to claim that Louisiana was theirs, not the Americans. So the, the Spanish figured, and, and the last thing I should say, actually, about the Spanish is that if we go back, uh, well, I won't, I won't uh, go back through all the maps, but this territory, uh, I, I showed you a map here. I can show you at least this one. Um, this map here, I think, shows pretty well. Uh, this map, actually, is going to be in my new book. Um, uh, areas of, of American sovereignty, which really, as I said, only, only jutted out into uh, Kentucky and, and little pieces of, of Tennessee. But the Spanish um, and, and Native Americans in, in alliance uh, controlled, really, this, um, this area. Um, so the Spanish continued to trade with the Choctaw Creek, Chickasaw, um, and, uh, and Cherokees. And, and Br British traders, uh, I mean, they had British traders in this area undermining, in a sense, Spanish influence. But, but this was another zone of Spanish influence. It, doesn't, it didn't just extend um, in, the, in the territory of Louisiana. You, you mentioned the Ohio River as one of the three corridors, but it strikes me that they never fought in the Ohio River in, in any of these wars you mentioned, except uh, Native Americans, maybe Point Pleasant, uh, something like that. Uh, was, was that an intentional policy? I mean, it, it seems like it would have been a warmer route than the, the two northern routes and a better trade route. A better, uh, sorry, a better, the, the. It would have been a better trade route because it, it, it would have been a warmer route than, than St. Lawrence leading to either of the two northern routes. Yeah, I mean, well, what I was, what I was talking about was a kind of, um, you know, a, the larger corridor connecting the, the sort of French Empire. And, and uh, 
I mean, there, you're right that there were no major battles along the Ohio River, but I think uh, there were a lot of a lot of important battles at these at these key strategic sites. So, um, you know, the the, the initial uh, quarrel. I mean, there wasn't a battle here along Fort LeBeouf, and then um, Fallen Timbers, which is uh, you know a really important one, happens very close to this uh, to, to this uh, area. It's along the, the Wabash River, um, where where the uh, I mean. We were, just we were just talking about this, right? This is as far as the, as the, as the ships can sail in from Lake Erie. Um, so it's right at this strategic point, which is, gonna, which is where uh, one of the major routes to con connecting Lake Erie down to the Ohio. So it's not along the Ohio River, but it's right at the very tip of the Ohio Valley. It's right at, this, at these, yeah. I mean, one of the, one of the ways that I've been thinking about um, this, this whole region, which is, which is, you know, really a vast region, but, but um, controlling the region, I mean, controlling thousands of square miles, um, it doesn't mean having troops along that, whole, you, along that whole area. I mean, you can't at this point. Uh, what it means is controlling these, these very key um, bottlenecks, these very key sites. And those, those happen um, basically at places where uh, one body of water sort of turns into another in a sense. So they happen at falls, all along the fall lines. They happen at these, at these points in between the lakes. They happen at places like Fort Miami right here, and, uh, right next to, to Fallen Timbers. Um, and so they, they happen at all these, these choke points where one sort of has to go through in order to get from one part of the, the region to another. And so these are all um, doorways into the Ohio Valley. They're not the Ohio River themselves, but they're uh, themselves. But, these, but, but many of these key battles happen at, at these doorways to the Ohio Valley. The land concessions in the Treaty of Greenville that Wayne got um, are are mile square or 12 mile square reserves around all of those key points in the Northwest Territory. And, th and that uh, I think probably helped the Americans plant settlements at places like Chicago and uh, things like that, that that allowed them to move into that territory pretty quickly. Thank you. Napoleon and the French Empire is undermined in Haiti by this slave revolt. What happens to Haiti after that? <laughs> is that another book? I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, well, that, that I mean, that's a long story. They, so they did the, the victorious Haitian troops. Uh, Toussaint Louverture was the brilliant general who, who led the Haitian forces for, um, for, for most of this period. And he, and he, in fact, fought, he fought initially for the Spanish. But once the French declared the abolition of slavery in 1794, um, that persuaded Toussaint to ally with the, with the French um, with the French Empire and, and defend Saint-Domingue against Spanish and British invasions. Um, and so Toussaint fought with France, for France, for most of that period. But over the course of the 1780s, uh, the 1790s, sorry, um, he became more and more uh, an autonomous leader of Saint-Domingue, which is part of the reason that Napoleon went, went back. What, what, um, he later, he, at St. Helena, he later said that it was one of the great mistakes of his career. Um, and this is somebody who had many mistakes in his career. Uh, <laughs> And he said one of his greatest mistakes was not to have simply recognized Toussaint as the leader of, of Haiti within the French Empire, or Saint-Domingue within the French Empire, but rather to, to have tried to reconquer it. Um, Toussaint was captured. Um, there was a, an attempt at um, nego treaty negotiations. Uh, and Toussaint, uh, you know, they had a white flag or whatever. And, and Toussaint, um, the flag of truce. Uh, and Toussaint uh, was in negotiations. The French. Uh, army kidnapped Toussaint, sent him back to France, um, and ultimately it was, it was Dessalines who led, French forces, who led the Haitian forces to victory. Was the Declaration of Independence, uh, in, Haitian independence was declared on January 1st, 1804, and the name of the island was, or the name of the colony was changed from Saint-Domingue, which had been the French name, to Haiti, which was the, the name that the original inhabitants, the, the Caribs, had given it um, uh, before the Europeans arrived. Uh, Haiti then, then uh, continues as an independent power. Um, it was, uh, it was um, more or less boycotted by the French, the British, and the Americans, all of, all of whom were terrified of this example um, for, their, for the slave interests in the rest of the Caribbean. France, by this point, had reestablished slavery in Guadeloupe and Martinique and its other possessions. Um, the British, of course, had major slave interests in Jamaica and elsewhere in the Caribbean, and the United States, needless to say, had major interests in the South. All of them, um, none of them wanted uh, to allow the Haitian... Uh, government to have a navy. None of them wanted to trade with, uh, with Haiti. Uh, none of them wanted to empower this, this uh, regime of former slaves. Um, and uh, there was civil war. There, the, there are major divisions in the island. Um, I don't know if we can, uh, probably can't see them on this map. Between the north, which is the northern plains where uh, Cap Haitien, um, 
is today, the whole plant is, is along the west, and then the south. Uh, Haiti is, is divided by, by mountains, and it's actually much easier to sail from one region to the other. So there were three large-scale um, large uh, regions, and um, Sando, uh, Haitians in the south under uh, Christophe uh, began to fight with um, troops in the north under uh, Dessalines, and there was a long civil war. Um, and eventually, uh, I mean, it's a, it's a long story, which, which you know, I don't know the, the overall contours of, but as we move into the 19th century, um, Haiti uh, continues to be isolated. I mean, diplomatic relations only are restored with the United States uh, during the Civil War. Lincoln is the one who, who reestablishes um, diplomatic relations with, with Haiti. In, in the 1830s, in order to reestablish trade with France, the Haitian regime uh, has to agree to uh, repay Fr French former planters for their losses, for the losses of their property, of their slave property. And so, so Haiti reestablishes a trade relationship with France, but has to pay back um, onerous amounts of debt. And actually, one of the things that the Haitian government is say, saying today is that they're owed money for these, for these reparations, basically. Um, they were forced to pay. The Haitian government, in a, in a kind of reversal of the situation we have today, the Haitian government in the 1830s was forced to pay reparations to the French for uh, the slave property that was, that was lost. And so it, in, it, it led to a cycle of debt, um, economic debt, uh, that, that lingered for a long time. Americans invaded in the 20th century. I mean, it's, it's been a brutal history. Other questions or comments? It's been a while. It's been a while since I read one of these, but um, the overture, mm -hmm. um, uh, th there was a great fear because of that uh, revolt and everything that uh, uh, Louisiana that they, they would move up into there and create a crisis up in there. Mm -hmm. And uh, I just wondered if you could comment on that. Um, Southerners especially, but even, even non-slaveholders, were terrified of the specter of, of Saint-Domingue. Um, the, the revolution by former slaves against their, their former masters uh, caused great fear among, among slave owners throughout the Americas but, but, and, and throughout the United States. And there are all kinds of quotes that somebody like Thomas Jefferson has where he's terrified of the... Um, uh, what he calls the cannibals of the terrible republic. Um, in fact, many Americans aren't even um, able to understand this as a kind of political revolution. They, they call the Haitians uh, bandits, or, um, and they accuse them of, of, being, of being in a fight not for freedom, but just a, a blind struggle, a blindly violent struggle. They, many Americans are unable to even imagine this as a political struggle. Um, it's, it's about sheer chaos and, and violence. And this is how the Haitian Revolution is understood by many Americans for, um, for a long time. It's, it's impossible for them to accept the idea of, of slaves fighting for their freedom. Um, and it's, it's impossible for them to accept the analogies between the Haitian Revolution and the American Revolution or the French Revolution. The French and American Revolutions are seen as struggles for political liberty, whereas the Haitian Revolution, um, in the way it's described by Americans, um, it, the, the, the political aspect of it is denied. Um, and, and cast aside, but it continues to cast a long shadow, um, even in the in the Civil War. I think one of the most striking references, I'm sure so many of you have read uh, Mary Chesnut's diaries from the Civil War. Um, they're, they're wonderful descriptions of, of, of her experience, lived experience in the Civil War, and there's, there's one um, line that I remember coming across in there where, where she, um, she even references uh, Saint-Domingue. This is in the 1860s, so even um, 70 years after the, after the uh, revolution in, in Saint-Domingue, um, a, a, slave, um, a slave owner is still um, terrified by the specter of, of what this could be. And, and slave owners live um, with this in the sort of back of their imaginations for, for a long time. Um, and, it can, and it continues, there's, there's a great debate among historians whether this, this advances or not the cause of abolition. Um, some historians say that, it, that it, it creates the model for slaves throughout the Americas um, to emulate, and, it, and, it, and it's a kind of standard bearer for slaves across the Americas. Um, but others point to the fact that when Saint-Domingue uh, when Saint-Domingue um, stops producing sugar, it had been the greatest sugar producer in the 1770s and 1780s, um, sugar, uh, the sugar industry now moves to Cuba and to Louisiana. And in fact, um, it, it's the cause of, of um, the, the retrenchment of the slave, uh, of slave, uh, colonial slave production, you know, crops like sugar. Um, and in fact, I mean, if you, if you, if you think, um, if you think as I do, that, that um, the Haitian Revolution is the, the kind of key to the Louisiana Purchase, um, to the Americans acquiring Louisiana, then what it does is it opens up vast swaths of the Southeast for the expansion of slavery into, um, in, into this, this uh, cotton belt. And, and so, in a sense, the Haitian Revolution, ironically, um, 
I mean, the, the freedom of slaves in Haiti comes in a sense at the expense of the enslavement of many others in North America. So it has, it has ironic um, results uh, which, which are quite contradictory. And that is a beautiful segue to our first program next fall on slavery. And right now, please join me in thanking Francois Furstenberg.